So when Ben approached me and showed me, you know, these vases, and of course, you know, I was blown away by how well they were made. Mm -hmm. And because I am open-minded, you know, I started thinking about, you know, crazy stuff, like maybe, you know, reptilian billions from other <laughs> stellar systems were making them with their scaly hands. Hmm. And if that was the case, of course, you know, they wouldn't use chisels or lathes. You know, they would use, you know, some other magic. And as a nuclear scientist, the thing that comes to mind is uh, you know, nuclear technology. Because everybody knows that there is so much more energy within a nucleus than in a chemical bond. It's not even funny. Yeah, right. And it's really <clears throat> thousand times, if not 10,000 times more energy per unit mass. Mm -hmm. Which means if you are an advanced civilization, you probably have mastered you know, nuclear science to the degree to where, to you, it's like nothing. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, it becomes possible to machine stuff by nuclear means. And that's where my you know, nuclear machining hypothesis originated from. Okay. I started thinking if I could produce isotopes, and you know what isotopes are, right? Uh, maybe you should give a broad definition sure. of it. But so yeah. every element in nature comes in several varieties. I like take iron. You know, there are several isotopes. It's still iron, but, you know, they differ by the count of neutrons, meaning uh, one is slightly heavier or slightly lighter than the other, but any natural element is a mixture of isotopes. Mm -hmm. And some isotopes are benign in the sense that the only difference between them is uh, just the count of neutrons. But in your body, in my body, in every object, you know, there is the same mixture of them. But some isotopes are not benign. They are radioactive. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is particularly important in the course of uh, nuclear engineering. So you build a power plant, you know, you put nuclear fuel in, and when that fuel decays, it produces a lot of neutrons that activate, meaning make new isotopes. Okay. So, so neutrons are kind of like a catalyst in nuclear science because they are absorbed by all elements differently. And when a, an element absorbs a neutron, it changes its isotopic composition. So it, one isotope transforms into another and a lot of isotopes that are formed by neutron capture are already active meaning they emit gamma rays they emit you know, alpha particles beta particles okay and what that emission means it's, it means an emission of energy and energy at a pretty significant level so to put things in perspective uh, like a common type of radioactivity is alpha decay Meaning, when uh, an element decays, isotope decays, it emits an alpha particle. And this alpha particle travels pretty much at a speed of light. Not quite, but, you know, comparable to the speed of light. So when it hits something, it erodes a material it hits. Mm -hmm. Basically takes layers away. It's, it's like a miniature projectile. And in the uh, context of uh, nanotechnology, this is known as... Uh, you know, nano machining or ion machining. So, in fact, uh, a lot of electron microscopes or a lot of, uh, you know, semiconductor fabrication equipment comes with ion beams. So it's yeah. like when you see, like, uh, in Chernobyl, when the when the meltdown happened in Chernobyl and they, like, tried flying the helicopter over it, it the helicopter just, like, disintegrated. <laughs> well, I think it's a, an exaggeration, but in principle, that's possible, you know, uh -huh. if you are... I thought that happened. It was in the show. Well, I would doubt it would have, you know, disintegrated uh, just because it was exposed to radiation at the level that Chernobyl could produce it. Oh. But in principle, you know, if, if you I have see. like a powerful enough uh, nuclear reactor, yeah, you know, shit would just disintegrate, you know, entirely. Right. So I would say, you know, the nuclear science in general, it's like the next frontier of knowledge because, you know, with it, you can do things that look like magic. You know, you mm. can make things disappear. You can make, you know, matter out of nothing. You know, you can change, you know, lead to gold. You can, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a more practical. You can turn lead to gold. Yeah. I mean, wow. th that's what, you know, nuclear science <laughs> theory, is about. In theory, right, right. In practice. Oh. Yeah. It's been done. I mean, you don't get a lot of it. Unless, on like a small, on a small yeah, level. Yeah. yeah, unless you have like a very powerful reactor. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you this example. 
uh, you know, like plutonium-239, which is, uh, you know, weapons-grade, you know, material. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, what, what you put in a plutonium bomb. Mm -hmm. That's a very valuable metal because unless you have, like, a critical amount of it mm -hmm. to where it will explode, you have, like, a small amount of it. The unique feature about it, it stays hot all the time, you know, red hot. So if if you like go on the internet and you Google a picture of plutonium, you'll get a picture of a glowing like chunk of metal. And that's what you know nuclear energy is about. It stays hot all the time, year after year after year, you know, decade after decade. Yeah, like that. Until it decays completely. It's just so full of nuclear energy that energy is coming out of it in terms of this alpha particle emission. Right. And how long does it, it stay like that? Years, decades. And, and this is one of the problems. This is one of the major problems with nuclear power plants, right? Well, this, this is what they say that you have to like bury the nuclear material. Uh, and, I will get to it, but okay. What what is unique about plutonium? So sorry, two thirty eight. Yeah, I mixed up with two thirty nine. Is uh, you send a satellite to space, let's say Voyager, right? Mm -hmm. It's too far to where solar panels aren't going to be any good. So how do you, you know? energize it well you put a chunk of that in it mm -hmm. and it stays hot and you surround it with uh, thermoelectric elements and you generate power oh wow okay and that's why it's it's super use useful you know super safe you know this particular one plutonium 238 yeah and in russia it's been used a lot you know to power polar stations and you know things yeah. of that nature and that's what the magic about it is like a perpetual battery you know that, right. that chunk is going to produce you know kilowatts of energy like day after day after day, you know, year after year after year for, you know, 10, 50 years and more. And, you know, you, how hard is it to create? Uh, or to get, do, 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 do you, can you make this or does this have to come? Uh, how, how does it work? I don't understand. You I'm make it in a, in a nuclear power plant. Yeah. So you make plutonium 238 yes, in a power plant. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You breathe it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, I forgot where I was going with this. Oh, so so you know, to me, this looks like magic. You know, this is like the mm. ultimate like magical artifact. You have a chunk of uh, of plutonium that constantly glows. Yeah. But by the same token, like in my research, I use uh, polonium two ten, which is similar. Plutonium two ten. No, polonium. Polonium. Yeah. Okay. Which is similar to plutonium, but the difference is, polonium decays slowly, compared to polonium. It kind of sounds the same, plutonium, polonium, right? Mm -hmm. So plutonium decays slowly compared mm -hmm. to polonium. So polonium takes uh, like half-life, meaning half of it is gone, like within like 238 days. Okay. Whereas for plutonium, it's it's years. So this means if you have a sizable amount of polonium, mm -hmm. the rate at which it emits energy is like a million times more. Than plutonium. Yes. But it just decays way faster. Yes. Okay. And and that's, you know, so you compress time, right? So it gives off, you know, this nuclear energy at a rate that's a million times faster. Yes. So it decays faster, right? Meaning if you had microscopic, quant not macroscopic, macroscopic, tangible quantity of polonium, you'd be able to, uh, like, produce a ton of these alpha particles that if you could direct them somewhere, they would just, you know, make holes, <laughs> Re remove material, you know, shave off material. Uh, basically obliterate. Destroy shit. Yeah, destroy shit, yes. And I'm thinking if you are an advanced civilization, you know, surely you mastered uh, nuclear power, and surely, you know, you can produce any isotope you want, and surely you can produce isotopes that, you know, let's say emit alpha particles for the sake of machining, because you then you have non-contact machining. You don't have any cutters or borers, right? You have mm. just this material, and it will remove, uh, you know, layers that you want to remove it just by virtue of ablation. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not, you know, controversial, not fantastic. You know, we use it in ion beams. You know, we don't necessarily use it, you know, with radioisotopes because we don't know how to direct, you know, those alpha particles. We don't have that, you know, technological. They just emit it in all directions. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean, you know, we can learn, you know, if we, if we wanted to, right? And also we don't synthesize them in, in large quantities one of the reasons it's expensive, you know, the other reason is it's regulated, and the third reason is uh, we don't know how to handle, you know, 
these materials and I haven't learned yet, but what was, what was, um, the material that was in the demon core that killed plutonium. that guy, that was plutonium. Yeah. Was that plutonium 238? I think it was 239. Yes. 239. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So 238 is benign in the sense that it emits only alpha particles. It's not going to be useful to make a bomb mm -hmm. by itself. Okay. Yeah. But 239, you know, you, you, you collect enough of it, it's just going to explode because you have this runaway chain reaction. But that, you know, alpha emission, you know, was one idea because it's just one of the particles that, that can be emitted. The other particle is a beta particle or electron. So basically when some isotopes decay, they emit either alpha particles, which is helium ions. Another possibility, when isotope decays, it emits beta particles, which is electron, high energy electron. Basically, it's a source of electricity. So if you had a, a material like, you know, cobalt 60 or, you know, cobalt 57, and some others, they even used commercially for making like tiny nuclear batteries. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a heart implant. You're not going to change batteries in a heart implant, right? You know, you don't want to open your chest to put a battery. What they do, they starting now to make this, you know, tiny nuclear batteries. Really? That are, that are powered by these isotopes that emit beta particles. And it's Whoa. called beta voltaics. And they use these now? Yes. The, uh, the drawback of these uh, is very low power. So you cannot run your iPhone on beta voltaics mm. yet. In principle, you could, you know, if you master, you know, the nuclear tech to the next level, in principle, you could. If you generated enough of this, you know, isotopes and it was economical mm. enough. Because what, what happens is they constantly produce electricity in terms of this, uh, you know, high energy electrons. Yeah. And not only you can power something, but also, you know, these uh, high energy electrons, they tend to saturate the the uh, you know lattice of the material with electrons and if you recall uh, solid state physics we have ions and then we have electrons and electrons are kind of like a glue that holds the lattice of ions together so if you add too many electrons into your lattice you change the elastic properties of your material so all of a sudden the material that was solid you know may become an appliable or Mm. malleable because it's just, it's just oversaturated with electrons. And that's a kind of a, you know, a conjecture hypothesis with some experimental support because uh, I don't know if you heard about, you know, Hutchinson effect. Mm -mm. So there is this uh, crazy inventor in Canada who is known to have uh, played with um, radio frequency equipment like radars and uh, radio generators and coils. Mm -hmm. And in his experiments, he would... Uh, all of a sudden, spontaneously, either metals would fuse or would crack, or, or metal would fuse with non-metal. It, it's like almost voodoo, but you know, I've seen samples myself, so mm -hmm. I know it hasn't been cooked. And the best explanation I've heard uh, of it is, uh, under certain conditions, you can oversaturate a solid-state lattice with electrons, and then the plastic properties of the materials change. So what? idea I get from it, if, if you have a, a nuclear isotope that emits a lot of beta particles out of all of electrons, you can put it in contact with the body that you want to machine, and all of a sudden, a body that was hard becomes soft as putty. And then, you know, you can machine it, you know, without too much effort. Mm. So it's, it's a different mechanism. So with alpha particles, you ablate, so you shave off layers by virtue of ions impacting and and punching mm. holes, but with electrons, you change elastic properties, and that's a transient change. Oh, this is the Hutchison, yes. the Hutchison effect. Mm -hmm. So, what is it? What's happening here, Steve? I think that's what he's talking about. It, yeah, it's, it's a block of, of metal. What is that? It's metal. It's a block somehow. of metal. Whoa! And they're shooting it with with uh, beta particles or no, beta? Just electromagnetic fields. Just electromagnetic mm -hmm. fields. Wow! Oh, that's wild. A block of iron. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable. And, and that's what I'm saying. I think the answer is in, in nuclear technology. So you think that they were using this nuclear technology to soften granite? I think it's possible. You know, I don't know. I can only speculate, you know, what sure. would happen in the past. But I'm thinking, you know, creatively, you know, as an engineer, what I would do if I wanted to mm -hmm. accomplish. And two things come to mind, yeah, I would use electrons to change the elastic properties of stone. 
and then I'd be able to machine and mold it. Mm. And especially that looks plausible in the context of Peru, where you have this, you know, polygonal uh, masonry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I look at it, it clearly has, uh, you know, superficial evidence of plastic deformation. And that's why uh, I'm very, you know, supremely interested in, in going there and taking samples that I can study in my lab and my electron microscope and subject those samples to my nuclear instruments to see if I'll be able to spot signs. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.